Um, and uh, welcome everybody to our April webinar um, for the IRC5. Uh, we're very, very privileged uh, this month to be joined uh, by Muslifa Hanifa, who has um, advised me to call her Mus. Um, and Muslifa, we're very fortunate to be joined by uh, because she has a CV that's frankly quite intimidating. Um, she's a Wellcome Trust Senior Research Fellow at a Lister Institute Research Fellow and Consultant Dermatologist at the Newcastle University um, and has uh, won a very impressive list of prizes, including um, being appointed Fellow of the Academy of Medical Science, being the recipient of uh, the Academy of Medical Science Fulks Foundation Medal, as well as uh, the European Federation of Immunological Societies Acteria Prize in Immunology and Allergology. Um, and uh, importantly, uh, Muslifa is a leading member of the Human Cell Atlas Initiative, um, which we're all very interested in terms of its potential application in all parts of biology, but especially potentially in the brain. Uh, and she's mostly been involved in pioneering this application um, to decode the developing human immune system. Um, so where uh, uh, I've been um, personally getting super interested in, in the immune brain interface. I'm a bit late to the game, but that's sort of been a, a, a building interest of mine in the last few months um, of how the, the immune system and brain interface during development. So I'm personally very excited to hear uh, all about this work. Um, a reminder that if you'd like to uh, ask a question, um, you can save it for the end. Uh, and then at the end, you can either put your, uh, there's functions in the webinar to put your hand up uh, if you're an attendee and then I can unmute you. Um, or you can ask questions as we go in the chat or the Q&A box if you're too shy to appear on camera and I can read them out for you. Um, so with that, I'll stop talking um, and uh, uh, um, invite Muz to take it away, please. Uh, thank you very much, Laura. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether I'm supposed to say good morning, good evening, good afternoon, or but it's pretty much all around the world. So uh, Just it's a great pleasure <laughs> to be here. I'm not sorry. It was just a joke. I was just saying uh, that's why we just I'm say not... g'day. It's Australian. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, so I'm not talking about the brain, but I hope um, the kind of concepts that I illustrate with regards to the immune system, particularly in the developing immune system, uh, will be um, helpful from the context of, uh, you know, studies involving the brain and using single cell genomics. So much of the work is going to be focused on the developmental cell atlas. Uh, within the Human Cell Atlas Initiative and specifically funded by Wellcome. So the kind of one of the features of the developing human immune system is this concept of space and time. And I guess, you know, that's something that's quite close to the brain as well, because, you, you know, within the brain, it's topologically very different from one part of the other to the um, one part of the brain to the other. So for the immune system, you've, you've got the yolk sac progenitors that are the earliest tissue that um, gives rise to progenitors that then make blood and immune cells. And then thereafter, you have um, the aotogonad mesonephros, a structure in the embryo which gives rise to definitive hematopoietic stem cells. And these then seed many uh, organs in the body and particularly the liver where you know which becomes a permanent site of production for blood and immune cells or also known as hematopoiesis and that goes all the way to about 20 post-conception weeks and then at about 12 post-conception weeks the bone marrow starts to kick in and really takes over from 20 post-conception weeks and becomes the dominant site of production of blood and uh, immune cells uh, in our postnatal life and you also have these kind of progenitors that see the thymus and they differentiate into T cells. And you have uh, B cells that are made in the spleen, uh, sorry, in the bone marrow that enter the spleen where they undergo um, subsequent maturation. And, and in addition to all of that, the immune cells that are made uh, in these hematopoietic organs enter the non-lymphoid tissues, such as the skin and kidney shown here. So there's this kind of coordinated um, production, dissemination, and establishment of the immune network across many organs 
preparing us for postnatal life. And this concept of space and time is very important uh, in prenatal life, uh, particularly. So one of the things about studying blood and immune cells uh, or the blood and immune system is the fact that, you know, I've alluded to the space and time concept, but also it's traditionally studied by two fields that have evolved in parallel. Hematopoiesis, which, are which is concerned with how the progenitors make those cells, and immunology, which is particularly concerned with what these cells uh, actually do in providing immunity. So this is very much a cross-disciplinary collaborative and white space. And I think this is very much what the Human Cell Atlas is about. You really do need multi-disciplinary uh, expertise and a lot of consortium have that you know everybody working together and this is really where you can make some game-changing discoveries and from the perspective of the immune system traditionally it's been a field whereby you're either t-cell immunologist or b-cell biologist you have your own lineages but you know it is a one system and the kind of whole of the system is greater than the sum of its parts and sometimes you can't quite see the emergent properties of the immune system unless you actually study it as a whole and a lot of these single cell genomics technologies have enabled that high throughput profiling so you can actually begin to see the patterns that might not be evident if you were to just study one lineage or you know small numbers of cells so i've just tried to illustrate this in this bird migration or migratory bird patterns um, as how one can appreciate this. And with the advent of single cell omics technologies, you can measure many, many different things. You know, DNA is, you know, tells you the history of the cell in terms of somatic mutation acquisition. Protein really reflect, reflects the past and present. RNA is a bit more about the present and the future and the epigenome is the potential. I don't think one is better than the other. They're all different um, uh, information about one cell. It's just multifaceted representation. So it's a little bit like if you were to have a thermal scan or an X-ray scan or an MRI scan, it's you. Not one is more. One is no more truthful than the other. Uh, and you know, but collectively and in composite information is very informative. And to study this, you also have to look at um, um, snapshots by age. So you know, you can't study human cells in vivo and therefore you can take several organs from one embryo or fetus and then you have to stitch this snapshot information to kind of like have a, uh, you know, temporal information. And we've been very lucky uh, to have the Human Developmental Biology Resource in the UK, uh, one of the major sites being in Newcastle, uh, which have, you know, provided us with a lot of the material. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about one uh, manuscript, um, Popescu et al., which was published in 2019, some vignettes about it. Uh, and in our approach to study the developing immune system, we sample as many organs from one embryo that are involved in the generation of blood and immune cells, and also um, what happens to those cells in the peripheral tissue. And then I'm going to touch a little bit about the uh, developing skin and adult skin. So some of the knowledge that we've gained and, and you know, also, you know, comparing with what's known in the literature, we've summarized in this review. And um, I'm going to now focus on fetal liver hematopoiesis. As always, it's very much a team science approach. Lots and lots of individuals with, you know, amazing expertise that we work together collectively and also from the first authors that were involved, you know, different people with computational biology, wet lab and genomics expertise to actually deliver the work. So if you were to think of how you're going to understand blood and immune cells that are made in the liver, you've also got to think about, you know, the cells made there that would then seed, for example, skin and kidney as non-lymphoid tissues, and what could also contribute to um, the blood and immune cells before the liver becomes a hematopoietic organ. So we looked at the liver, but we looked at the skin and kidney up to 12 post-conception weeks so that we know, because thereafter it could be seeded by bone marrow-derived cells. And so we took into account of yolk sac as well, because that could also give rise to progenitors that would enter the skin, kidney and liver. So we studied all of these organs in order to be able to kind of like understand uh, how these cells are actually made and seed the tissues. 
So this is um, the sort of um, visualizations that you will receive with single cell data. So essentially you profile, uh, you know, what we did was to profile RNA of uh, the, the whole transcriptome of individual cells, and then you cluster the cells, and then based on the you know, gene expression of those clusters, you can then assign them a cell label. And here we've got about 24 cell labels. And essentially you can see the lymphoid lineage, the megakaryocyte, erythroid, my, uh, mast cell lineage, and the myeloid lineage. What's very interesting about the fetal liver is you don't see any neutrophils. Despite neutrophils being the most abundant white cell in postnatal life, it is what you need to really fight off bacterial infection, but you don't make it until bone marrow hematopoiesis. So that's, you know, RNA to kind of like um, identify cells, but, you know, you can have orthogonal validation methods, which are always very useful. These days you can do surface protein combined measurements with RNA, or in, in that, in two years or three years ago now, we basically looked at the RNA device, the flow cytometry gating strategy, isolated the cells, resequenced them using SmartSeq2, and also perform morphological analysis, which is something that's often used uh, by hematologists to identify cell types. So adding further validation that, you know, what we identified by single cell profiling are indeed the cells that we've annotated. So some of the insights that we gleaned was how the hematopoietic stem cell intrinsic property actually changed across a short period of time within the fetal liver, within weeks, essentially. So if you took hematopoietic stem cells uh, from the liver, single cells, and culture them to see what colonies they would make. And if you compare those stem cells that are from six to nine post-conception weeks, 12 to 15, and 15 to 18, you will find that their ability to make erythroid cells or red blood cells declines with gestation age. Their ability to make B cells increases with gestation age, and their ability to make myeloid cells increases with gestational age. So this tells you that something's happening that's changing the hematopoietic stem cells so they give rise to different cell types and that's one way of how the composition of the fetal liver and by by default the blood and immune cells are regulated obviously the liver environment is also changing uh, and so you have this kind of like niche effect uh, that may be supporting different types of uh, blood and immune cell product production in the yolk sac compared to the liver, compared to the bone marrow. Another interesting observation is this, you know, the niche in tissues that can support different types of hematopoiesis. What we were very surprised to see was in the skin, uh, here you can see uh, mid erythroblasts and late erythroblasts, and in the liver you can see the early, mid and late cells. So it's suggested that actually during development at a time when there is high demand for red blood cells to transport oxygen around in the body during prenatal development, some tissues such as the skin, but not the kidney because we didn't see that in the kidney, are able to support um, uh, erythropoiesis. And we looked in the fetal skin and, and saw these uh, nucleated erythroblasts, uh, the primitive red blood cells, both inside and outside of the blood vessels, suggesting that either the cells leave the liver and then some of them at different stages, or there's actually some, you know, there's something that's supporting their uh, differentiation. And I think because we find them in the extravascular compartment, it's indicative of physiological erythropoiesis also going on there. And then the third point, which is once the cells enter the non-lymphoid tissues, the peripheral organs, and that would include the brain, for example, it very rapidly adapts to the microenvironment. So you have the microglia, which is a type of macrophage, um, very much adapted to the brain environment. And if you look at some of the immune cells, for example, here, natural killer cells and innate lymphoid cells, they express the canonical markers that define them as those cells. But in the liver, in the skin, in the kidney, there are some gene expression that characterizes you know, the, the different tissue compartment. And this happens really very quickly within sort of weeks of entering those cells. And I mentioned how we, we took um, cells or, or took organs from uh, many organs from one embryo. And this allowed us to kind of like uh, integrate the data across organs. So this is just to illustrate, you can take the cells from the thymus, these are all the progenitors maybe, from the thymus and from the liver. And then you can see 
the lymphoid progenitors uh, project in the same space in this human visualization, um, showing that you know before bone marrow actually uh, becomes a site of hematopoiesis, progenitors from the liver can actually enter the thymus where they differentiate into naive T cells. And this is one way of kind of like addressing this space and time issue. And um, something that's very kind of like close to my heart and also for the human cell atlas is that these data sets are, you know, provided for lots of people to use and browse and, you know, make the most out of it. And so we provided the uh, developmental data sets um, in this web portal, developmentcellatlas.ncl.ac.uk, where you can look at the, um, browse the portal, look at the gene expression, whatever that you're interested in, hover around and it'll tell you which cells um, is there and also um, look at the gene expression as kind of like a pseudo bulk basically as a you know the based on the annotation of those cells and just type in list of genes to kind of like decide you know whatever that you know you're interested in and then it will show you the expression um, of that particular gene in all of those cell states so now i'm going to show a different example so the the studies the, the particularly the liver study actually highlighted some of the kind of like uh, information or knowledge on hematopoietic stem cells that will be relevant for stem cell you know uh, therapy and tissue engineering uh, and and actually you know and trying to understand development and health and also some of the kind of like uh, uh, diseases that have their onset in childhood so in the portal, we also um, have enabled browsing by genes that are causing primary immunodeficiencies, and you can look at their expression, uh, you know, in, in the fetal liver data. But one thing we were very surprised when we did look comparing skin was how developmental programs that are actually active, uh, you know, in prenatal life re-emerge and are co-opted in inflammatory skin disease. So this was a, a massive undertaking looking at healthy skin, prenatal skin from the first trimester, and also two common inflammatory skin diseases, psoriasis and atopic dermatitis. And we used several um, orthogonal methods, the main kind of like discovery platform being single cell um, RNA sequencing. And we studied um, there about half a million cells from healthy atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, and prenatal skin. And again, using the single cell um, um, analysis, you can identify the different cell states uh, in here based on the kind of like um, different broad um, cellular compartments. One of the things, as I mentioned, what we've done with the web portal is actually allow people to look by disease and then if you click on, for example, neoplasm or, uh, or urticaria, it'll give you a list of genes that have been shown to be causative and, and present uh, with, you know, urticaria and um, quantification diseases, and you can browse the web portal that way. So we compared adult and prenatal skin and found that prenatal skin was very much enriched for fibroblasts and innate immune cells like natural killer cells, macrophages and innate lymphoid cells. And when we compared uh, all of the immune populations between developing and healthy skin, we were struck that the developing macrophages were very similar to one type of macrophages in adult skin, MAC2. And for vascular endothelial cells, they were very similar to one type of vascular endothelial cells, i.e. B3. And when we looked across a, a broader set of developmental organs, again, B3 and MAC2 in adult skin corresponded more closely to all of these developmental macrophages and vascular endothelial cells. And what was very surprising as well was in our single cell data, V3 was expanded in, in inflammatory disease proportionally, uh, and so was macrophage too. It became the more dominant uh, macrophage population in disease compared to macrophage one. And so, because we, we didn't have very many patient donors for in, in our single cell data, so we took a bulk RNA sequencing data set and deconvoluted that for the V3 signature and looked at the healthy a atopic dermatitis and psoriasis uh, data sets, you know, that much bigger numbers, 38 for healthy, 21 for AD and 27 for psoriasis. 
and sh showed a very similar or observed a very similar representation of V3 and MAC2, suggesting that in a broader, in a separate cohort of patients, those cells were also expanded. So what are these vascular endothelial cells? They are essentially dilated capillary venules. They're very much like high endothelial venules. And if you then ask the question of what gene programs are expressed in prenatal skin and conserved in the V3 of adult uh, disease skin, you'll find that these are all looking Leukocyte recruitment and gene programs relating to that and angiogenesis. And when we asked about, uh, we did the same analysis for macrophage 2, again, it was very much about leukocyte recruitment and angiogenesis and postulating that maybe V3 and MAC2 were interacting. So in the manuscript, we actually went on to look at the receptor ligand interactions and also showed that they were in close approximation in the skin. And to summarize that, essentially the macrophage 2 produces CXCL8, which interacts with ACKR1 on V3. And this was something that was predicted um, from the cell phone DB analysis. And we found that these cells were, you know, uh, opposed in the inflamed skin, more so than healthy skin, and actually decline when you actually, when the patients are treated. And this is what's driving this leukocyte recruitment program and angiogenesis. So why do we need this in prenatal skin? It is what it is probably the program that allows the immune cells to seed the peripheral tissues. And this becomes activated in disease whereby immune cells are seeding the tissue uh, but causing inflammation and pathology. So I've shown some examples from the liver study and the skin study, the clinical relevance of this sort of, you know, descriptive in many ways, but, uh, you know, looking at the, the broad picture, the overall kind of like um, organization of these tissues and, and showing the relevance for cell therapy, childhood disorders, lifespan and aging, and also the developmental pathways that are emerging uh, in adult pathology. I'm now going to shift gear um, to talk about some work that we've done on COVID-19 to illustrate how, in many ways, the HCA infrastructure, research framework, and team science um, provided some sort of like, you know, in a, in an you know, unacademic preparedness when you know the world was hit by the COVID-19 pandemic you know, we decided to leverage what we had in terms of the um, research framework um, and our expertise in single cell multi-omics to, to try and understand the immune response to COVID-19. So I'm going to show you the analysis we did across three centers uh, in Newcastle, Cambridge, and in London. And, and again, this is a massive team effort. Um, it's, you know, you have to coordinate like the clinical interface to collect the samples, the data generation, data analysis, and these are all of the you know, uh, PIs that were involved. This was very much a cross-sectional cohort study. These were patients who arrived at the hospital, were then bled before they were given any treatment. And they, um, you know, and this was the dream team of uh, researchers that actually were involved in the data generation and the, and the data analysis. So it was quite a lot of intense work over a very short period of time. But what, what it allowed us to do was to kind of like very quickly be able to analyze 130 patients of which we had some who were COVID-19, but asymptomatic, mild, moderate, severe, critical, and some healthy controls and also healthy individuals that were challenged with intravenous uh, lipopolysaccharide as a part of a separate study. So asymptomatic individuals are healthcare workers the ones that were mild were symptomatic but not requiring oxygen. Moderate was symptomatic, requiring oxygen. Severe were in ITU and requiring non-invasive ventilation. And critical patients were essentially in ICU and intubated and ventilated. Um, and this was the kind of like real um, value of the HCA community. We very quickly you know, discussed amongst ourselves what was the platform that we were going to use and to try and standardize protocols and reagents. So we all used total CXC, which allowed us to kind of like measure 188 surface proteins on each and every cell, alongside uh, whole transcriptome profiling and also for TCR and PCR analysis. So this is the, um, the kind of like a, the, um, all of the cells, about 800,000 cells in total in the peripheral blood and their broad annotation 
All of these data set, again, is available on COVID at covid19.salatlas.org. And you can also download the, the data object. So if you go to patient donors, and then you'll be able to see all of the different data sets that are already there, and you can download the data and also browse the web portal. And our approach to this study was to look at the peripheral blood cells as a window to understand what's happening in the peripheral tissue where the infection first set in and how the peripheral blood can tell us about what's happening in the bone marrow, which is responding to this infection in a more systemic way. So we took a data set that was already published uh, uh, from, by another group that looked at the bronchi of a lavage sample. So this would be uh, cells including the alveolar macrophages so that we can try and see how the blood and the um, you know the alveolar populations uh, correlated with one another. So I'm going to show you some highlights from this study. The first is relating to the myeloid cells in the peripheral blood. We identified for the first time this complement expressing non-classical CD16 monocytes and you can see here the genes C1Q, A, B, C that really characterized this population. And what was surprising is in the COVID-19 alveolar macrophages, uh, these, these, the, the, the cells there uh, are very much also expressing uh, the complement proteins and similar to the non-classical monocytes that we saw in the peripheral blood. And these cells are expanded in disease compared to healthy, as well as these proliferating monocytes that were also very, um, you know, in, in some ways similar uh, to the CD14 monocytes uh, in peripheral blood. So what was very interesting in the comparison uh, between healthy and COVID-19 uh, blood and um, alveolar um, cells was that if you look at healthy individuals, the cells, it, this is inferred differentiation trajectory, this is PAGA um, connectivity, and you find that it's the CD14 blood monocytes that are predicted to differentiate into bronchial lavage macrophages or alveolar macrophages. But in COVID-19, it's the complement expressing monocytes that are most similar to alveolar macrophages. So in, in this inflammatory setting, essentially a different type of monocyte is now found in the alveolar compartment. These cells are very similar to what people have called petroleum monocytes. So it may be that during inflammation, where the vascular compartment is leaky, you have, you know, these cells are actually able to then enter the alveolar compartment. And what do they do? So these, these alveolar macrophages are the ones that are really producing the cytokines, the inflammatory cytokines, and also all of the chemokines here that are recruiting um, the um, other immune cells into the peripheral tissue. Um, what's also special about these monocytes is their ability to interact with platelets. So we did a receptor ligand uh, analysis. They are the ones that seem to express very high levels of receptors and ligands that are uh, predicted or, or, or uh, expressed on platelets. And if you look at COVID-19 platelets, uh, the activation markers expressed by platelets in these patients increases by disease severity. And, you know, what's, what's also very interesting, so, so this tells you that the, the, the monocytes are more likely to be interacting with platelets. Platelets are activated, but what about the progenitors that are making the platelets? So the data set allowed us to actually look at the hematopoietic stem and progenitor compartment. So these are the cells. And you know, we can then infer what's happening in the bone marrow. So if you look at these cells that are the most primitive progenitors before they actually express um, any of the lineage commitment markers, these, the CD38 positive HSPCs, um, seem to have an express, you know, they're ex and, uh, pop, uh, highly enriched for megakaryocyte signature genes. So suggestive that there is megakaryocyte priming very, very early on in the progenitor fraction. And if you then look at the megakaryocyte progenitors, which you know, probably arise from these um, CD38 positive cells, these gray ones, they're expanded in, in symptomatic disease, uh, but not necessarily in healthy or asymptomatic disease. So essentially, there's a coordinated efforts in terms of the monocytes that can interact with platelets, and the expansion of the progen megakaryocyte progenitors 
uh, and also early commitment to become a megakaryocyte progenitor of the HSPCs. So with regards to the T lymphocytes, we was able to kind of like annotate with very high you know, detail um, resolution based on the RNA, protein and TCR. All of that was really helpful. And the striking observation was the fact that the CD8, uh, the clonally expanded cells were primarily CD8. And of those, there was an expansion of CD8 effector, which you can see in this kind of like uh, light yellow shade to the effector memory cells. And another way of visualizing this is that you see how this increases with disease severity and then it drops back again in critical disease. Um, and we looked in more detail at the B lineage compartment. So you can use again RNA protein and the B cell receptor to finally annotate all of the different um, B lineage cells. And what was really striking is this expansion of plasma cells and plasma blasts, all of these here in, in, in the kind of like a symptomatic COVID. And despite this expansion, what you find is that IgA and particularly IgA2, which are related to mucosal um, IgA responses, are preserved in healthy and asymptomatic, but massively decline in symptomatic patients. And so although the plasma blast and plasma cells were expanded, this was not IgA and IgA2, which actually go down, and in fact, it's IgG. So it's almost suggestive that the IgA2 response is actually probably very beneficial and seems to characterize the asymptomatic patients. And plasma cells uh, require T follicular helper cells to, to actually support their differentiation. And in the peripheral blood, you have circulating T follicular helper cells. And when we looked at the correlation, we found that you know, high levels of T follicular helper correlated with high levels of plasma cells. And so this whole, um, you know, uh, there seems to be a coordinated immune response involving the myeloid um, compartment, which, which which kind of like makes these cells that can bind platelets uh, and actually enter the alveolar compartment. You have this systemic response whereby there are more megakaryocyte progenitors and you know likely platelets being produced, and you have this kind of like uh, different responses in asymptomatic and symptomatic. Uh, severe COVID and particularly in the severe diseases what I alluded to earlier about the different balance between the effector memory and uh, T effector CD8 cells. And then in the um, B cell compartment, the um, you know IgA2 which decline which is preserved in asymptomatic patients and then declines in disease severity. So you know this is very much like a, a way of how you can use uh, a broad profiling, single cell profiling technique to kind of like understand what is actually going on and infer how it you know relates to the peripheral site pathology and in the bone marrow. So I'm going to stop here and I have lots and lots of people to thank my lab, uh, many, many collaborators and a lot of my work is in partnership with Sarah Teichman uh, and our funders and um, a pitch um, if anybody wants to join the lab and I'm going to stop sharing and happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Moose. It was a, a tour de force and uh, I was surprised for myself that I, uh, I thought that my peak area of interest was going to be the human cell atlas, but it turned out to actually be the nitty gritty of the immune system that I have questions about. Um, so in the, uh, I'll ask the first question, therefore, um, in the sure. brain, uh, I, I work on um, development of the brain and, and uh, there's similar questions in terms of the, the uh, multi-potency and potentially progressive um, uh, uh, redu um, reduction of, of fate potential as, as progenitor cells progress and they make different types of, of neurons in our case over time. Um, and it was originally uh, 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 thought that you couldn't revert a progenitor cell at a late stage of development and therefore that that potential was cell intrinsic. Um, but uh, recently that was turned on its head where they, uh, some, some, a group showed that if you take a late stage progenitor um, and then you transplant it into a young stage brain, um, it, will, it can make 
um, the types of neurons appropriate to the young stage. So they are plastic to go back to older fates. So I'm not sure, I, I, I noted with interest that, that it's a very similar concept in, with the liver progenitor cells. Um, and I wondered if there had been those experiments of taking an older liver progenitor cell and transplanting it and what that showed, if you knew. Yeah, I think um, for the, at least for the immune cells, it's kind of quite hard. You, you know, no one has ever been able to sort of take a differentiated cell and then make them uh, into a progenitor cell. Um, but what I think um, a lot of these methods fail to kind of recognize, it, it relies on like a linear differentiation fate trajectory, i.e. you start from a stem cell and you end up, and it's like a one way where you have a series of restricted potential. Mm. But I think it's going to look like there are many ways to get to, you know, the differentiated progeny. You might have like pathway A and pathway B, but they end up in the same kind of like a end state. Or you can go along pathway A and then somehow get shuttled and become go down pathway C and make something completely different. Mm. Or you actually go back a little bit and then go another another way another way. And I think all of that are possibilities and actually really important to entertain and address. Uh, but a lot of the methods that are currently used for inferencing trajectory. Um, inferencing differentiation trajectory uh, are very much linear mm. but certainly for immune cells I think you can take a T cell uh, without kind of doing some sort of reprogramming for it to become a progenitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah it's very there's, it's interesting how many parallels there are I think we all think that our disciplines are, are so unique and special in their um, absolutely the, but that's a repeating story all over the, the body. Um, so we have a, a question from uh, Rodrigo Suarez in the chat, uh, who says, thanks for a great talk, which I um, uh, agree with. <laughs> How complete is the human cell atlas and what would be uh, the ideal for continuing it in the future? Yeah, uh, uh, that's a great question because, you know, you really want to know when is the atlas complete. And in some ways, I sort of like see a parallel with the Human Genome Project you know, there is a first draft, a first version whereby, you know, the human body is about 37 trillion cells. You know, we may not get to the full 37 trillion cells in the first draft, uh, but, you know, we will have a, a good sort of like prototype version one. And in many ways, I think that will happen with the developmental cell atlas uh, based on the kind of like logistics, feasibility, current costs um, etc so i i would predict that within a year we will be able to kind of like have a whole embryo atlas of at least one gestational stage uh, quite early on because of the numbers of cells that you need to kind of like profile to have to make it comprehensive and then obviously you can kind of like add many other components you know spatial analysis and also technologies will will, will evolve uh, but i don't think that means that the first version of the atlas is then completely redundant. I think all of this will just be built upon. I don't think one needs to be able to measure everything about cell, but you can kind of like computationally model and integrate those that, that sort of information. So yes, I would predict within the next, you know, two years, we will have a whole embryo atlas um, and that will just grow as we learn how to kind of like, you know, handle the data, the scale of that data set, how to analyze the data, and all of those lessons would be very useful to kind of like extrapolate to the whole human. Mm. And I guess, human. I guess that you would be, you wouldn't be close to the idea of doing single cell attack seek and, and those kinds of things in addition as, as funding and, and data computation becomes uh, available. Yeah, I mean, I think that will be the ideal so that you can then, you know, integrate the, that in the information. But, it, you know, at the moment, we can do RNA, we can do attack, we can do nuclear, we can do surface protein of, you know, whatever, about 200 or so. But there will come, you know, a time when we will be able to do pretty much many, many things all in one cell. 
uh, and that will just add on to the existing you know information it's a bit like a, a map you know mm-hmm. uh, a map that's five years old versus a map you know now some buildings are different but you know quite a lot of things are already there mm. yeah it's fascinating um so so i think because uh uh, where we're quite a, a young um, consortium and we have a lot of different uh, researchers who are in genomics, in um, human imaging and tractography of the brain, who are in cellular developmental uh, biology. Um, and one of the, uh, a, a large goal of the consortium, I guess, overall is to start integrating uh, those disciplines more effectively and um, uh, it not not duplicating experiments, not duplicating resources, and and being able to to answer questions quite efficiently. Um, so so a bit of a broad question, but given the success of the the Human Cell Atlas initiative, do you, do you have any um, suggestions or lessons learned of of how to make those international uh, uh, initiatives work? And and um, you know what what could be the best um, structures of organization or initiatives to to make those things happen yeah i think having very modular structures and uh, early data sharing is quite important so hca uh, within the consortium you can share data uh, even before it's published and there's a thing whereby they follow the fort lauderdale principle so it's sort of you know this is kind of something that came from the human genome project so it protects the people who generated the data and give gives them the sort of like first opportunity to publish other groups can take you know a small component of it but not necessarily you know publish the entire data set that is then you know shared with the rest of the community and i think sharing these data sets and actually working together uh collaboratively because I somehow think, um, and this is this is something that I I feel like I'm a dermatologist, and I think, you know, when you are trained in the field, you think like your field, and actually having the perspective and input of another field is very refreshing, because suddenly you find yourself, you know, relieved of these boundaries and constraints that they are artificial. They are just there because that's kind of how you've been brought up in that field. And, and actually having this, you know, input is really good in the same way that, you know, your perspective in another field is probably very refreshing and valuable. And I think just being open, sharing data and working to the collective good, because the more you share and the more you work together, the bigger your discoveries. I mean, a lot of our papers, you know, we couldn't have done it. With, I mean, just look at the COVID-19 paper. You know, the way we approached it was literally was divide and conquer <laughs> we generated all of the data and then we had different research leads uh, for t cells b cells myeloid cells progenitors and you know overall computational strategy and you know we we did all of that then we came together and then we put all of the data together and integrated it into a coherent narrative so it's, it's much better that way because it, it becomes a much stronger paper. It would have taken us much, much, much longer to do all of these things because, you know, how do you know every, in detail about every lineage? But if you have an expert in that field, they can do that section for you very well. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely uh, uh, clear that that's the way of the future. But, uh, but I think in many ways, it's just getting there, kind of still the, still the ways of doing it are, are, um, can be difficult to navigate. Uh, so we have a question. And developing oh, that sense. So I was just going to say, develop that sense of community because yes, you know yeah. you need trust and you know personal sort of like relationships in many ways that helps. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sorry. So, uh, so we have a, a question from um, Paul Lockhart. Um, so you should be able to talk now, Paul. Um, if you unmute. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Fabulous talk. Um, I have. Thank you. On the, the data sharing point, um, which is what I wanted to follow up on, I think that's a great point. On In the early part of your talk, you talked about the web portal where yeah. people could go in and actually query by their gene of interest or by disease state. So I have a couple of questions to that. Is that hosted by the Cell Atlas or is that from a specific group keeping that data um, online? So, yeah, there are two, two kind of options. Um, 
there is the CZI cell by gene uh, kind of like application that anyone can actually use to host single cell data. Um, we started off before that came about and really in my case, my, because I'm not computationally savvy, my postdoc just got fed up of me asking every single plot. And then he kind of like said, I've built this portal. You can just do whatever you like. This was our prototype portal. And then I said, this is fantastic. Let's have it for every project and let's actually make it part of our publication. So that was how our portal came about somewhat serendipitously. Um, so, but we've, I kind of like then realized the value of this and built this in, in a more um, structured and in a, in a massive way, I guess. Um, I put a lot of investment into it. Um, but HCA itself doesn't have a portal, but CZI has the kind of like implementation. So anyone can use cell by gene and host, um, host that data set and the, and the portal if they want to do for their data. Yeah, okay, because I imagine it's a massive undertaking to yeah. just keep things current. I was just thinking even with the case where you can query by disease type, you know, the, the genomics field's moving so fast that genes must be appearing all the time that need to be added and curated. Do you, do you link that to something like Panel App Genomics England or? Yeah, you... so, yeah, so we linked that. So we, a database was basically linked with, um, DDD, Developmental Disorders, the, the UK kind of consortium. And so that that was how we've done that bit. But you, you're raising a very good point in terms of the longevity and how we continue to sort of like maintain the portal. And as we develop this develop, the, 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 the developmental work, we're now working more closely with, uh, you know, to, to be able to incorporate spatial data and also um, allow these web portal applications to actually uh, be updated and more sophisticated. So it's a work in progress in many ways, yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, were there any other questions? In the ch you can write them in the chat or um, raise your hand. Uh, I think uh, at least in Australia, I had some emails from a few people who are on school holidays with their kids. So uh, they're going to listen to the recording. I think <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> and some emails yeah. and questions if there's anything pressing. Um, oh, we've just got comments saying excellent presentation. Great. Well, it's coming up to the hour. Um, so with that, uh, on behalf of everybody, thank you so much for, for a fascinating talk on, on two sides of the the immune system that I'm, I'm going to spend the rest of my day, I think, looking at, at immune system progenitor cells. I'm super interested now, um, uh, but also about the, the, the lessons learnt from the human cell atlas. Um, so thank you so much, Ms. And um, uh, hope, uh, thank you also for your contribution to the COVID effort and, and uh, we're hopeful that that's all, all, all coming into um, uh, better times with all of that and that we can start to travel and see each other sometime in the future. Yeah, I think so. I think Australia's done very well and let's hope the rest of the world yeah. uh, comes out of this impact. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you in uh, Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.